summer is over, it's September, uh, less than four months left of this year. So if you want to achieve something with your AI, uh, you're in the right place and the time is right as well. Uh, this is the fourth uh, Making AI Approachable webinar. Uh, the topic today is uh, AI in Europe. I'm one of your hosts, Mikko Peltola, and I have the, uh, Petri Salonen here with me today. Hello. Um, together, ACX and TELUS uh, cover uh, strategy design and engineering, so we can help you whether your project is related to AI or, or other digitalization. We're going to do a brief introduction of the company. Uh, companies, we're going to keep it very brief, and then we'll dive right into the content. So, Petri, why don't you get started? Thanks. Um, very happy to be here today again. Uh, this is our fourth webinar. So, Telus has been in the market for 17 years, delivering um, different types of workshops, mainly focused on road mapping, strategy, business design uh, for very large uh, IS globalized Vs uh, in the macro space, but also to a lot of smaller and mid sized organizations. And one of the key things that um, I'm super excited about is that we only focus on the strategy side and now with the collaboration with ACX we can also uh, provide the design services and the engineering services. Back to you Nico. Okay thank you Petri. So then uh, briefly about ACX uh, we are a, a North American Europe focused uh, consultancy uh, boutique consultancy we do design and uh, development on the design side anything from research and insights to UX design and visual design then taking those designs into reality through our front-end development and secure back-end capabilities. And we really focus on the more uh, progressive use cases, uh, a lot of work on the extended reality and artificial intelligence space. Then the agenda of the today. Um, so we're going to do a bit of a recap of the uh, content that we have created during this summer. So since the summer is over and if there are people who are kind of uh, starting their uh, journey, uh, we will revisit some of the topics. This is quite a brief section. Majority of today's time is going to be uh, exploring uh, AI in Europe. So what kind of interest people have, uh, what are the benefits they can get, um, how uh, we can protect the consumer and society. Uh, the AI laws uh, are a big part of that. And then we look into the financing and, and resources in Europe. And then we received a lot of positive feedback about the approachable AI examples that, that we provide. So Petri is going to give the latest and greatest on the Microsoft uh, co-pilot space. So let's dive in. Harnessing AI. Um, so we have we have uh, recapped this summer's like content, what we have uh, produced into six tips. Uh, the first two are about uh, educating yourselves. So if you want to look at some like theoretical AI skills, there is a um, like online course uh, from University of Helsinki, the elements of AI, I've been through that. It, it is a bit theoretical, but like, it gives a good foundation. If you want more pragmatic approach and like real examples, how to build AI out of the cloud service providers like Fast Offering, uh, Microsoft has the best uh, AI focused uh, training and the Azure AI 900 basics, something that uh, both Petri and I have been through, and uh, it, it is a, it's a good use of time if you want to get kind of high level understanding how to make AI reality. Now, these take quite a lot of time. Um, if you don't have that much time, we try to kind of boil down the essence of AI into these approachable AI webinars. The recordings are available in YouTube uh, and our webpage. Uh, the first one is about generics of AI explaining the basic concepts and those examples that I, I mentioned, Petri gave some good examples in the Microsoft universe, like how AI can be used in your everyday work. The second one is about customizing AI. So how can you get started? It doesn't go very technical, but introduces the customization concepts so you can like follow the conversation in your organization and maybe even lead it. Third one is uh, on the money side, so cost and pricing of AI. This uh, Today's focus is Europe, and our next one is going to be AI and cybersecurity. We can also arrange tailored webinars. So if these uh, are not spot on what you need, if the starting level is too basic or too advanced, or the interest is a little bit off, uh, please contact to us and we're happy to accommodate like a tailored uh, webinar for you. And then um, 
there is an AI readiness assessment. If you want to move from slides to reality, a good way to start is like assess what's your starting point, what's your ambition, and do you have the necessary means to like, go through that transformation? Uh, we, we have done a lot of uh, uh, coaching uh, for, for the companies. Uh, Petri's uh, Telus website has a lot of modules around the packaging and pricing, pricing and strategy related things. And there is also good content on our uh, ACX website. Uh, so we have uh, case studies and blog posts and so on. So these are possible starting points for you if you are jumping into the AI train now or you want to recap certain topics, uh, just want to make this available for you and hope that they are helpful. Then let's move on to the main topic of the day. So AI in Europe. Uh, we'll start with the interests and the benefits uh, of AI. There's not a lot of difference between Europe and US globally. One thing that we did find, uh, there is a, like a, a study about the interest in, in AI. And this one is measuring like how regularly have you used uh, AI um, uh, overall. And uh, comparing Europe and US, uh, the number of people who have at least tried AI is the same. Also, if you look at the office use, it's almost the same. Where there is a difference is the kind of outside the office exposure, where there's like 10 percentage points difference. And this could imply that in Europe, there is less interest, or it might be that because there's so much money going into AI in the US, and there's so much marketing and so much exposure, that it's easier to, to try here, uh, maybe in, in Europe, that, that is coming later, or, or there is just uh, less, less interest. But it was one of the few data points that like stands out in the comparison between uh, Europe and, and US. Then let's look at the potential. So, so this, is a, this is an interesting study about the, um, comparing the generative AI versus the traditional AI. So you can think traditional AI, everything until ChatGPT came around. So all the traditional um, advanced analytics, uh, traditional machine learning, uh, deep learning that have delivered us things like Google, like uh, advertisement and search optimization and many other things. And those uh, have a huge potential impact on global economy, talking about like over $10 trillion. But the blue bar here um, represents the change that what the generative AI has brought. And if you think about how, how fast that happened, uh, it, has, it has happened in, in, in less than a year, like uh, become public uh, uh, knowledge. So generative AI ad is adding a significant boost into the global uh, economy uh, on top of the like traditional AI and other, other uh, optimization techniques. So where does this happen? Where, where do we see this potential? So uh, this is a very interesting chart. So, so this is mapping the impact uh, by function. So we have functions, for example, sales and marketing there in the top left corner. And the y-axis is, is uh, uh, talking about the global impact, how many hundred billion dollars uh, uh, can generative AI uh, impact. And then on the x-axis, you have the percentage uh, as a functional spend. So you can see that sales, the percentage is quite low, but because every company does sales and it's so expensive, the impact is in a kind of 500 billion uh, dollar range comparable to marketing. And these dots marked with blue, they represent 75% of the total annual impact of the generative AI. So there are clearly some uh, functions that stand out where most of the companies can make a difference with AI. It's worth noting that these, the ones lower down, the, the black dots here, they are still significant. So, so we're talking about tens or hundreds of billions of dollars. So you can definitely find interesting use cases and benefits if you operate in, in, in these kind of functions or are interested in, in bringing AI, it's, it's not a, a, like a lost cause. If we compare these numbers, like uh, Google's annual revenue is uh, not of 200 billion, Amazon is somewhere like 500 billion range. So there are these kind of outliers, some like use cases where you can bring AI and optimize search or marketing. But after that, it starts to be like a long tail. So there is uh, uh, like a, a lot of companies need to do a lot of changes to get to the same level of uh, uh, impact. If we drill a little bit deeper here and we look at the business functions, so we see that the marketing and sales, 
regardless of vertical, is high impact zone. After that, there's another high impact zone, which is the so, uh, software engineering. Um, so you see dark blue across the uh, verticals. But after that, it starts to get more sporadic. So in banking, customer operations is, uh, is a hotbed. Pharmaceuticals, it's product R&D. And in education, uh, it's uh, operations. So you really need to drill a little bit deeper to understand like what combination of functions and verticals might be hotbed. And of course, there is potential elsewhere as well. So uh, we, we're happy to help you if you want to assess your AI readiness and your starting point uh, through uh, these kind of uh, tools. Then uh, let's look at one, one more thing here. So the, um, what is the generative AI's automation potential by activity? If you look at the bottom end of this chart, you see those areas where traditional AI represented by the black bar has already addressed a big portion uh, or, or has potential of addressing a big, big portion of the automation potential. So data management processing data, 73% uh, of uh, potential uh, for automation. And you can see that the difference between blue bar and black bar is not that significant. So that represents what the additional that generative AI brings here. But on the top end of the bar uh, chart, this is making a collaboration. This is where generative AI has made and will make the biggest impact. So we can see that things like applying expertise, which, which could be like being a lawyer or some branches of, of uh, med med medical doctor work, uh, managing and uh, interact the interfacing with stakeholders, which largely, for example, sales. These are professions and functions where uh, your words uh, play a big role and generative AI thus has a huge potential for automation. So you can see massive changes like 20 to 30 percent uplift in the, uh, in the potential. And uh, like if, if you read these like studies further, uh, the, the potential for automation uh, for cu current tasks is somewhere like 60 to 70 percent overall. And uh, the, like estimates are that like uh, maybe midpoint 2045, so in 22 years, 50% of our work will be automated. And we like um, highly educated people in, in kind of uh, higher levels of the organization, um, we've been mostly watching these like changes happen to other people. So physical work, data management, it didn't touch me personally. But when it starts to getting applying expertise, managing, interfacing, that is where we see the hit. So it's gonna be a, a big change uh, in how we work uh, going forward. So then next section is uh, curiously named as uh, protecting uh, the consumer and society. And this is kind of an introduction to the AI legislation. So um, I, I looked at like, what are the concerns people have? And uh, uh, my friend Ari Tulla summarized this in his recent LinkedIn post where I took a subset of this. He raised good topics like, uh, what are the ethical and social implications? Loss of trust, inability to distinguish between real and fake, which leads to political games. Elections influenced by deep fake speeches or interviews. And then on a personal level, identity theft and personal attacks. So deep face risk, personal lives and reputations. So there are many concerns in this kind of uh, raising AI and generative AI. And the, the closest parallel, what has happened before that we could find is the, is the data residency. So Europe came up with the GDPR requirements and strict requirements that all the EU residence data needs to be stored and processed within the EU. And of course, this is like a bold move to make such a legislation. Um, but what we see is that the big, big cloud service providers, they will follow these, these laws. Europe is so big um, in terms of market potential that AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, everybody, every one of them has set up data centers in Europe and they follow the Europe, uh, Europe law. Another kind of curious observation of this is that the big three, these companies, they own two thirds of Europe's cloud spending. There are like uh, native European players, DT, the Deutsche Telekom being the, the largest one, but they control a meager 2% share um, and they are the biggest uh, European player. They are also in this like the Gaia X, but uh, overall it seems that the, it's the US tech running Europe and uh, hopefully that changes at some point. So Petri, um, why don't you walk us through some other ways that the consumer society has been protected 
And this is not EU and it's not legislation, but it is like big companies doing things voluntarily. So, Mr. Microsoft, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So I've been really working with Microsoft and Microsoft ecosystem for the past 17 years. And I, I will remember those days when some of the vertical markets like financial industry and you know, insurance, oil and gas, they said, no way, never, ever in the cloud. And guess what? Uh, that's where the money is now going. Financial institutions, a lot of organizations are moving to the cloud. <clears throat> this slide kind of shows the specifically the Microsoft uh, 365 Copilot, which is the latest addition to the Microsoft stack. And um, the important thing here is, and I'm, I'll come back to the architectural slide for a little bit, a little bit later in this presentation, but Microsoft Copilot calls the LLM, the large language model, and it's routed to the closest data center in the region, but can also call into other regions where capacity is available during the high utilization periods. So the, the message here is that it's always trying to keep things in its own home region. And besides this, the LLM call processes customer data and memory and returns the response and other customer content artifacts to the home region. And none of the customer content is written outside the home region for the user. And this is key, important, uh, specifically having run tens of workshops for global organizations. Uh, every single time there's a question happening, where is that data going to be written? How can I make sure that we are compliant with the regulations uh, on a global basis. And then additional, European is a little bit different as well. So for European Union users, uh, there's additional safeguards to comply with the EU data boundary. So that really means that the EU traffic stays within the EU data boundary, while worldwide traffic can be sent to EU and other geographies for LLM processing. Let's move to the next one. So showing the the um, EU uh, map with all the places. So if you look at this map, so the boundary is really EU and EFTA, and Microsoft is committed to store and process that data uh, within those um, regions. And this applies not just for uh, Microsoft 365, but also to Azure Dynamics 365 and, and the Power Platform, which is a key platform also for Microsoft. Let's move to the next one. The, the other thing that Microsoft has really taken seriously throughout this year, so already back in 2017, Microsoft wanted to define six AI principles that is core to their strategy. And in fact, if you take the AI 900 course and certification that uh, I and Miko did, this is going to be key part of the questions that is going to be posed. And I wanted to bring two main things here to kind of give an example what it really means. So if we talk about the privacy and security, the use of AI should really be designed to respect the privacy and provide data security. And this principle really prioritizes the need to protect individuals' data and personal information while deploying AI technologies. So you might ask yourself, what does that really mean? So let me give you an example. So if we take a facial recognition system, privacy and security would involve only collecting and using data for the purposes for which explicit consent was given. So think about this, explicit consent was given. And this might also mean that um, the data is encrypted um, and ensure that it's not, it's only used to be, uh, solely used for an identified purpose. And a good example would be unlocking a device um, or not doing it for, for example, for unauthorized surveillance. So that's the privacy. Well, how about transparency? So trans in the concept of context of Microsoft, Microsoft believes that people should know when an AI system is making decisions that impact them and how those decisions are made. So it's really to help um, users to understand the capabilities and limitations of AI and providing insight into how decisions are made. I'm going to give an example. So let's say, let's assume that Microsoft would create a healthcare uh, prediction AI. So the transparency in that case might involve providing doctors and patients with a clear information on how predictions are made, how the data is used, and the confidence levels of those predictions. 
And this could be like uh, having more detailed documentation, having maybe user-friendly dashboards, or other ways to explain how that decision was derived. So it's really important to have that transparency in place, which, by the way, is not um, uh, easy to do. Back to you, Mikko. Good. Thanks, Petri. So then let's move on to the EU's emerging AI legislation. And, and first, let's look how relevant people consider this to be. So, so here you see the generative AI specifically. Generative AI related risks organizations consider relevant. And then secondly, the risk that they are working to mitigate. And you can see cybersecurity inaccuracy, uh, IPR there at the top of the list, uh, and then regulatory compliance uh, like followed right after that. So almost half of the organizations consider this to be a, risk, a relevant risk and one third of the organization, one quarter are, are mitigating uh, that. Then, of course, you could wonder, like, are people taking these actions just to be compliant because they want to follow the law, or is it uh, because they see that underlying topics are uh, um, important and interesting, but uh, that we don't see from, from this day? So what is the emerging EU law? Uh, there is a, like a negotiation position uh, uh, like reads this summer which is one of the steps uh, like on the, on the legislation after which it goes to the uh, different uh, country level uh, like uh, debates. And uh, th this uh, emerging EU law is categorizing AI into three buckets. There are things that are flat out prohibited. So remote biometric ID systems, uh, biometric categorization, and this is like from American perspective, US perspective, interesting that the citizenship status is one of these categorization uh, like uh, principles that is prohibited. Whereas in US, uh, it's, it's very much something that people are categorized on. Um, predictive policing, uh, emotion recognition, and then like untargeted scraping for facial recognition databases. So if you don't have like a targeted purpose, you cannot just like uh, collect facial recognition. So these are here to uh, prevent us like uh, heading into this dystopian future. Uh, don't go there. Then there is like high risk AI. If you operate in this space, uh, you can do it. It may very well be profitable and uh, sensible thing to do, but there are more controls in place. So, so if, if there's like a significant harm to people's health, safety, fundamental rights or the environment, uh, then these like higher risk AI rules are in place. And specifically then systems that are influencing voters and elections are listed here. Everything else, including the generative AI, uh, like uh, the large language models are, are, are in the general purpose AI. And here the requirement is to comply with transparency requirements. So you need to disclose that a, a, the content is generated with AI. And if you remember one of those like concerns that we, we presented earlier was like, how do you distinguish between what is real and what is not? Preventing models from generating illegal content. And then if you, uh, if you have used copyrighted data for training your system, you need to publish that. So th this is how you categorize uh, your, your AI exercises. And then what would be requirements if you, for example, fall into high risk uh, AI system? What kind of actions you need to take? You need to have a risk management system in place. You need to pay attention to data governance and management. You, it touches your technical documentation that needs to be updated. Your logging and record keeping practices need to be revisited. Transparency and provision of information. You need to uh, introduce human oversight into some parts of the process. You need to assure the accuracy, robustness, and cybersecurity, conformity assessment. You need to register with the uh, EU member state government. And then you need to keep monitoring your system once it's in the market. So a lot of responsibilities for companies. And this is this is for anybody who is building or operating in Europe. So it is not just European companies, but if you represent the company outside Europe and you plan to do business in Europe, be prepared for these kind of tasks. So then what just was the um, timeline? And we actually received like a, a question uh, from Rahela uh, on this that uh, are, are, are we moving fast enough? Um, and uh, I would say no. Normally, legislation is not moving fast enough. It's very challenging in this kind of fast moving space uh, to, to uh, like apply the laws that are, are coming uh, in, in place timely, especially like 
mammoth laws like in Europe that cover all the sectors and uh, all the use cases in all the all the all the countries. So it takes time. If we look at again comparison of GDPR, uh, which requires the explicit content from from individuals, it was proposed 2012, adopted 2014, and it went effect six years later 2018. So these things take time. The AI law that we discuss here doesn't fall into a vacuum. Uh, there are already laws in place. So in EU, there's a Digital Services Act that has been in force since 2022. And there is a Digital Markets Act uh, that has been in force uh, since uh, also 2022. And, and these uh, are the Digital Services Act is about uh, illegal content, how to have transparency in the advertisement and how to address disinformation. So partially overlapping, but then AI laws uh, take this deeper. The DMA is, uh, is like uh, the purpose is to make the digital sector fairer and make sure that the large online platforms that are in a gatekeeper position are keeping the playing field fair for everybody. There's also AI liability directive, uh, which defines then that if something goes wrong, who is liable and to what extent it's, uh, it's draft states. And it's not only EU. EU may be like in the leading front here, but in US things work a little bit differently. So, so it, uh, the legal uh, framework is more of a patchwork. Um, US has requested already financial institutions information on their use of AI based on the like existing legislation. The US Federal Trade Commission made a statement that they have authority under the existing law to pursue uh, enforcement actions relevant to the AI. And this year, half of the U.S. states uh, have introduced and 14 have passed AI legislations. Many of these nowhere as comprehensive as what the EU is doing, but uh, they are taking steps into this, uh, this direction. So it's fast moving space. So then let's switch gears um, and let's look at the financing uh, in, in Europe. So if, if we look at the VC or like capital invested in Europe, and compare that to the United States, the US is one third of the, the United States size. Both the markets have come down uh, like 50% over the past uh, two years. But this is because the, during the COVID times, there was like a huge bubble. So we are getting back to the normal level. Europe is, go, is still going down faster and it, the starting point is one third. So not in a like an equally strong position here. Now, this is all VC. So if you look at the AI funding in, spec like, uh, in, in, in specific, the U Europe European generative AI funding is around $3 billion. And uh, this number comes from $51 billion capital like invested on an annual level. The AI share of that has been steady 12 to 17% over the past years. But the big change happening is that the generative AI share of that AI share has been ramping up fast. So a couple of years ago, it was non-existent, starting to ramp up, and now it's one third. So the global generative AI market, uh, uh, VC funding is 40 million billion, and in Europe, it's a meager 3 billion. So not that much money flowing into, into EU, uh, EU area. And that's, of course, then impacting the activity and like uh, how, how we ramp up the resourcing here and, and, and so forth. Uh, Worth maybe noting outside this chart is that this is the VC uh, funding. On top of that, the big players uh, like NVIDIA, Google, Microsoft, OpenAI, um, they are US headquartered and have significant part of their operations in US. So that is adding uh, to the kind of uh, picture where the AI related economic activity is happening. So, so then let's look at the resourcing uh, of, of AI. So this is one chart I didn't expect to find. Um, when asked how hard it is to recruit AI-related skills, actually people are saying that it's easier this year than it was last year. So one would assume that it gets harder when this uh, thing wraps up. Maybe this is because of the uh, tech downsizing that happened at the beginning of the year, especially in, in US, maybe it's the kind of lesser activity there, uh, but, but this is, this is what, what people are reporting uh, at the moment. But I, I wouldn't take this as anything representative of the next five or 10 years. Uh, we have significant challenges when it comes to the resourcing, uh, the a AI is gonna change the landscape. So let's look at that a little bit more in detail. 
so there, there's a lot of good data from from McKinsey. They have uh, come up uh, recently with, with good reports. Um, th this is one of them. So if we look, there are only 15 percent of the companies that are actively working on the AI space who assume that they will increase their headcount in the next three years. The number of companies who are planning to decrease their workforce is three times that, 43 percent. So big change is coming to the marketplace, uh, the job marketplace. And of course, these are not the same resources. The, re the resources that um, get downsized are not necessarily the, the same skill set that you need uh, when, when you're recruiting. And, and that brings the second point here. The share of employees expected to be reskilled re in the next three years. And you can see that pretty much every organization, there are 8% who say don't know. Everybody else is saying that they need to reskill people. And over 50%, over 56% of the respondents assume that at least 10% of their workforce needs to be reskilled. And that is a massive undertaking. It's, it's, we probably haven't seen this kind of shift ever before. And I'm especially concerned about Europe because there are very strong labor laws and unions in Europe, which may work to the benefit sometimes, but maybe maybe um, slowing down this kind of transition. So how can Europe stay competitive in this kind of massive shift uh, in employment, the work, the amount and quality of the work that, that AI requires? Uh, we looked in one of the earlier webinars about the cost and challenges of, of hiring. Um, so let's look the same thing uh, through European lenses, and, and we took Finland as an example. So we looked at some typical AI skill set or, or, or uh, profiles, uh, specifically like people who have like five years of experience, so not, not juniors, um, and uh, this is uh, Glassdoor data. So da data scientists cost, salary cost, uh, uh, and other, uh, it includes bonuses, but not the other uh, social security cost is six to thirteen thousand dollars uh, euros a month. So with the social security overhead like twenty two percent, this goes to up to one hundred and ninety thousand euros a month. And the similar numbers for senior AI, AI engineers and senior software developers. So we're looking at pretty much the same picture as in the US. So if you want to put together a team of three full time AI uh, like skill sets, you're looking at 450,000 euro uh, range. And then you can start considering that is your resource need, whatever you plan to do with the AI, constant and predictable? Can you hire this top talent, considering like how big shortage there is going to be of these skills? And if you can hire them, can you keep them involved in interesting projects so you can retain them? And then these are the kind of uh, specialists in the in the AI. Can they also do the reskilling? Uh, so, like the the massive need to reskill your employees. Can they set that AI culture and understanding in your organization? So, not surprisingly, uh, the, not every company is going to recruit their own uh, people. So uh, the, then the the answer is outsourcing. And, and this one is from Bain, um, and uh, they, they said they studied this, and it, indeed, AI-related skills are in the top four uh, of uh, uh, like areas where, where companies plan to increase their outsourcing. So 67%, two in three, plan to increase the AI outsourcing over the next three years. Only 8% of the companies plan to decrease it. So a lot, lot happening there. Um, be, uh, on the lookout, like what's your outsourcing strategy and who are the partners you want to outsource to? Mikko, one comment to that slide. Yes. So it's, I think it's also important to understand that, you know, if you outsource uh, functions that you kind of haven't had before, so it allows you to also test out with lesser risk and also then uh, have the people that you might, the company might hire to learn at the same time. So eventually you can yeah. transfer that those outsourcing into <laughs> insourcing in a way. So I think it's yeah, a smart yeah, way to do it. Very good point. Yes, yeah. good, good point. So then let's jump into some practical examples. So back to you, Pedri, what's happening with the Microsoft and the Copilots? <laughs> Perfect. So uh, in the first webinar, I showed uh, some of the things that, that um, Microsoft is uh, embedding into Office 365 
um, and I encourage you to go and check them out because you know it, it's really mind blowing how the co-pilot well, using the LLM large language models allows to do. And I just wanted to bring here some additional things that Microsoft is now doing. Um, so they are adding really Copilot and LLM into every single product that they have uh, in the stack. And I would also say that um, any organization, any ISV independent software vendor that is not uh, considering using LLM is going to lose the business. Um, I'm using, um, in my workshops, a mural.co. Um, and I would assume that what you are seeing here now uh, needs to come into that solution, which it's it's not today. So uh, Microsoft Whiteboard um, is now integrated with uh, LLM functionality. So uh, you can do your prompting and it's automatically then going to provide you with some um, potential examples like you see in this in, the, in this case. But what I think is even more important, if you go to the next slide, Mikko, is that it's going to be able to do what is so hard. And I'm in fact running a workshop next week in London, and um, we are going to have 10 people in my group, and we're going to do a lot of sticky notes. And the question that I have, how am I going to be able to categorize those in a very short period of time? And now by using LLM AI, uh, guess what? That's going to be able to uh, do uh, in Microsoft Whiteboard solution. And I expect every single competitive solution in that Whiteboard space will have to have this feature. There's no question about it. Let's move to the next one. Um, so this is something that I wanted to describe to you because, you know, um, all of us have used keyword-based search in the past. And let's assume, for example, that I'm going to do a keyword search uh, in the old fashioned way, healthy eating. What will happen is that the system would scan through all the documents and look for the exact phrase healthy eating. And it's going to give uh, you a list of documents where the, these two words appear. Guess what? It doesn't provide the context. Um, it doesn't, um, it, it just lists all the documents that has a mention healthy eating. In the other hand, what semantic index does, it understands the meaning and the context behind the words. So when you search for healthy eating, it knows that you are likely interested in nutrition, well-being, maybe a balanced diet, and it will show you the results that not only have the exact phrase, but also include information that's truly relevant, relevant to the concept of healthy eating. So. Um, this is not just going to be in the co-pilot. Microsoft is embedding this technology into other products as well. So we're all going to benefit out of it. Uh, for example, SharePoint is a good example. Let's move to the next one. We all use <laughs> PowerPoint and we all have the issue of um, getting some nice graphics uh, pictures. Guess what? That time is over now with uh, the integration of OpenAI's image generator, generator DAL-E. Uh, uh, within PowerPoint. And uh, here you can see uh, some samples of what you can do. And if you move to the next one, it will also allow you to rewrite the presentation. So for clarity, and I, I think um, I use, and I know Miko uses um, OpenAI um, to uh, look at our writing and make sure that it, it, it uh, it's, uh, done in a way that it's uh, clear what we are meaning with uh, with the the statements that we do so i just wanted to bring these um, examples and this it, this same embedding is is in outlook it's in all the different products at microsoft but these are the new ones that i wanted to bring um, to you uh, let's move to the next one because i wanted to go back into um, the architectural model, just to repeat very quickly what it means and what is it that you have to do to get prepared for Microsoft Copilot. And as you can see from the picture, so just um, think through this. So you are in any one of those uh, Microsoft apps and you want to do a prompt. That prompt goes into Microsoft Graph, which really understands everything about you all of your emails, files, meetings, chats, calendars, and it also knows the security levels that you have uh, in your um, tenant. So it's not going to show anything that 
you are not allowed to sh uh, sh see. That prompt, once it goes through this grounding process, it's modified, modifies the prompt, and it goes to the large language model. It gets the result, and guess what? It goes through the same grounding because now it's going to check that the, res the response from the LLM is, first of all, according to the standards of the organization, so it's not breaking any rules of the organization itself, and then gives the result back to the um, the app itself. So it goes through this uh, very intensive, secure way of requesting the data. And I want to now emphasize a few things that goes back to what Nika has been talking about. The data does not train Copilot. It's your data. The This model doesn't use OpenAI's public service. No data is written outside the home region. And Microsoft does not claim ownership of the content created by Copilot. And Copilot respects the permissions in the content created in the M365 tenant. So it's very important that nothing will be going outside to the world uh, of what you're doing. If you go to the next one, because now the question is, what do I have to do? And you know, I, this uh, Microsoft has really done a good job to define how you can prepare yourself into the co-pilot environment. But I've been working in the SharePoint collaboration space for the past 15 years. So I would say one of the key things that you have to do is to look at your existing environment before you deploy anything. So making sure that you are not oversharing anything, making sure that you are setting restricted access control policy in, in your tenant, which really means that you are giving authority to people what they need, not what they potentially might need. And Microsoft has uh, some additional technologies like Microsoft Syntax um, that allows you to manage that oversharing. And then a key thing, it's the Microsoft Purview Information Protect and that um, when you do data classification in enterprise environments, that will really help you also to make sure that um, nothing that the uh, user asks from the um, co-pilot is not returning information that it's not supposed to be there. Just let me give an example. <laughs> if HR related information is unprotected, guess what? That uh, prompt that the user is doing might return salary information for for the entire organization so you don't want that to happen so um like i said there is good uh, advice um, how to get ready for and we can help you in this as well back to you thanks but these, these are really good examples so if, if you think about like earlier in the presentation we talked about the generative ai and how it's going to bring this like 30 percentage point uplifting the potential for automation. Um, it was for applying expertise, it was managing, and it was the communicating with the stakeholders. And this is where we spend our time. Uh, knowledge workers spend one fifth, 20% of their time finding information, and it's going to be so much easier. The use cases with the PowerPoint and, and whiteboarding, they, they are what we do every day. So they're very good examples. Thanks, Patrick. Exactly. Good, so let, let's recap what we, what we covered today. So um, if we look at the interest between Europe and North America, awareness and office use comparable, but the internet interest or, or exposure uh, 10 points lower in Europe. Then uh, protecting society and AU laws, uh, there are concerns of no, using non-EU EU AI tools. So, so not maybe everybody is aware of the EU legislation, and this is both uh, like a risk and opportunity. So if you are an EU-based company who is planning to uh, provide tools, uh, uh, maybe this uh, brings your peace of mind for your, your audience and, and customers. It may also be in, in EU that like building your own tools is a more compelling option because uh, the uh, commercially available tools may not be. You remember that like the, there is this long tail, so, so like many of the tools and solutions may not be applicable and uh, like uh, valid here. Financing in Europe, uh, BC money, a fraction one third of the US level, trending further down, and especially in the AI space, seems to be like less than 10% of the, the level of, of US uh, investment. Um, 
As a result of this money inflow, much fewer AI products and processes will be built in the EU and with EU understanding. And additionally, like outside the VC money, the big players are uh, mostly in Europe. So a, a big concern for Europe, how do we keep up in this competition and uh, keep uh, knowledge here? And then resources in, in, in Europe, uh, one could say that due to the less early investment, there is going to be a, low, a slower ramp up curve. And that is going to be a big challenge. How do we handle the massive retraining and workforce shift, downsizing some parts and, and hiring in other, other parts, if we don't have enough early action so that we, we start building the competence pool and, and, and understanding in Europe? So uh, if you have any or any of these like ideas, if you want to get an assessment, how to get started, if you want to move from slides to action, uh, we are happy to help you. Uh, Petri and Tellus can cover the strategy. Uh, ACX can cover the design and development. And remember, there are less than four months left of this year, so clock is ticking. We want to keep sharing our understanding. The next webinar is in three weeks time, and we're going to have our first guest star. Yari Saloma is my, my long-term colleague. Uh, he is currently CEO and co-founder of, of Valo Security, and uh, he has worked uh, for FireEye, uh, for Salesforce, ServiceNow, and uh, has a vast uh, understanding in this space, and an overall a great guy. Another event um, will be in, in Oulu, uh, like uh, present uh, live. There's a Future Tech Oulu event, October 12th, so if you are there, uh, please join us, and it would be great to Great to meet you in person. My friends, this concludes our fourth Making AI Approachable webinar. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll make the recording available shortly. And uh, if we went through fast or, or you want to go through something, uh, feel free to revisit that. Also, if you have any questions, don't be shy. Reach out to us and uh, we'll, we'll respond to you. Thank you for joining. Have a good day. Thank you so much.